deep coverage of what a TPM is and what it does. Now let's talk a little bit more about what's it good for. So the big benefits that we get from the TPM, um, and you know, all those little tiny functions, we can do neat tricks, but fundamentally, we usually want the TPM because we want one of machine authentication, yes, I want to be able to know exactly which machine I'm communicating with, um, at a station where I want to be able to make a claim about my machine state to some other party, and we'll get to you know, formal definitions of that later, um, and data protection, where I want to um, make sure that some of my data is kept secret uh, against usually software threats. So machine authentication is in many ways the easiest of TPM applications to, to roll out. It's the one that you basically get for free anytime you say, this is a TPM key. It's awesome. So we can use TPM keys to reliably identify a machine for a very simple reason. The TPM is soldered to the motherboard. <laughs> so any key that is cryptographically bound to a particular TPM, anything that is non-migratable in that term that I introduced earlier, we know for a fact it's always attached to that motherboard. It's never going anywhere else. So software on that machine can freely use it, but I cannot, no matter what I do, steal that key and take it away to somebody else. So there's two different ways we can use those keys to do machine authentication. The first is finding based, where I'm basically making the claim that some data at least passed through machine X. We usually say came from. We don't necessarily know where it originated. That's a little co more complicated than just a signature. But I can at least say machine X signed this, so I know machine X sent it, regardless of where it originally came from. The other is decryption based authentication. And this one is one that most people don't think about. It's not quite as intuitive. I can encrypt data and ship it across the network. Heck, I can publish it in the New York Times, and I will know that only Machine X can read it. And I can use this for secure data distribution, but I can also use this to say anyone who shows up with that data in hand, well, Machine X must have read it. And depending on how I design the protocol, I might even be able to prove that that is Machine X as a result. Um, and I'll get into a little more detail of what these protocols will look like a little later. Attestation is a word I'm going to be using over and over and over again, in part because this is most of what I use TPMs for, where we want to present verifiable evidence about machine state to a remote party. This is sometimes called remote attestation. In my opinion, that, that's a bit of a misnomer because it's a remote party, but, you know, variations. Um, that verifiable is critically important. The whole idea of attestation is I want to make a claim about a machine and you don't need to trust inherently that machine is telling the truth. You can actually evaluate the evidence for yourself and decide how much do you trust the TPM, how much do you trust the root of trust for measurement, and does everything there line up. So you, you don't have to just say, yes, good, no, bad, you can actually check for yourself. So quotes are really not out of station. I'm sending you a signed report of the PCR contents. You can check yourself. Um, any time that we have PCR constraints, almost any time, and VRAM we can't really attest to remotely, but if we have a key that has PCR constraints, we can use that for attestation also. If I know that a key is only usable if um, the PCRs correspond to my default corporate image that was installed yesterday, that if I get a report that I know is fresh because it's got a nonce in it, and I say, here, I've signed this report with this key, and that key is locked to that image, you know that that image is currently present. So there are, there are some neat tricks we can play with that. Um, because we have that, those PCR records, a remote verifier can check the boot state of the machine. And if we're doing neat tricks with the dynamic rate of trust for measurement, we can go beyond boot. This is potentially really, really powerful. This is in some ways the holy grail of um, a lot of corporate uh, visibility. I want to know exactly what my machines are running. Unfortunately, it's not quite as easy as it sounds because hashes are hard to interpret. 
hashes are fragile, making sense of those PCR values is very tricky. You see, and how do I know whether those PCR values are the ones I want? Well, that's a good question. Um, the best we've got today tends to be either this machine was good yesterday and it hasn't changed. And I say it's good because, well, I, I installed it yesterday and I'm pretty sure that was a good image. Or um, in some very rare cases, um, we've seen people using what are gold disks where you have an image that is on a CD and you're booting from the CD and you're, you believe that that's to be the case. Um, we're working on getting better at that. Um, there's some neat work going on in the research world in what's called property-based attestation where I can um, evaluate not based on what exactly the PCRs are but what certain you know, associating certain measurements with given properties that I can do more fine-grained permissions. There's work in the BIOS world to make sure those measurements make a little more sense. Unfortunately today, these values are very fragile and they are very hard to predict. So this has a lot of potential, but this is not a panacea. We cannot actually use this today to do what we would like to do, which is to say, are you running, is your machine up to date, did you patch it yesterday? That's not a capability that we really have yet. We're working on it. Um, also, data protection. So, we do have people who want to use the TPM for bulk data encryption. You can't. It is just too slow. This thing costs less than a dollar. We all refer to it as a cryptographic decelerator. It is that slow. <laughs> do not try and use this for large-scale operations. Um, and on top of that, because it does only use the public key cryptography, you're, do, you're taking a very slow chip and asking it to do some very slow operations. So this is not really designed for bulk crypto. On the other hand, it's tremendously valuable if you want to encrypt small high value data such as a symmetric key that you can use for bulk encryption. Um, or you can use it to protect the rest of your keychain. You know, you can use it today, one of the TPM applications that actually exists, I'm on Linux, I'm running Thunderbird, Thunderbird has its, its little key store, I can actually use the TPM to protect Thunderbird's key store. So I'm using the hardware based keys to protect the software keys that I, you know, PGP keys or whatever, maybe different formats. Um, we've seen it used for password stores. So you can do a lot with this <clears throat> as long as you keep in mind that if you want to encrypt something big, you're usually actually encrypting the key that you use to encrypt the very large thing. Um, I don't know enough about the export control regulations. I merely know that this got around them. Okay. So, um, exactly. Yes, so, so BitLocker is one of the only market applications that uses the TPM today. It doesn't by default, but you can configure it to. And what it is doing is this trick where it encrypts a symmetric key okay. that it decrypts and then uses to decrypt your hard drive. So it is not actually using the bit locker, the TPM private key to decrypt your entire hard drive. Even for Windows, that would be a massive slowdown. Oh, yeah. It's decrypting the bulk, the bulk key. Um, they do, or they can be configured to use PCR values. Um, such that it will say what you know, what are the PCR values right now. It will encrypt the, the data to that. When you turn the machine off, it, you can set it to, uh, I'll be honest, I don't know enough about BitLocker to know when it does its, you've just updated Windows, updated to the new PCR values. Yeah. But I know that one of the things you can do with BitLocker, if you want to, is set it to certain good PCR values such that a BitLocker encrypted drive cannot be booted in Linux or with a live CD. Whether you want to do that or not depends on your personal opinion, but Microsoft thought it was a great idea. Okay. So there are, that is one of the few applications out there that is using the PCR constraints because it is using them to make sure you're not accessing that hard drive unless you are running 
your genuine up-to-date copy of Windows. Ought to look like. How accurate that is, where it's getting that, that's a level of detail that I don't have. Uh, Microsoft's very opaque about the nitty-gritty details of how BitLocker works. So, um, and in fact, see, look, you can use this for hard drive encryption by doing this measure key. Oh, I didn't see that right. um, uh, there are some Linux disk encryption software that I've heard use the TPM. I would assume they're doing the same thing. Again, I don't know about them in any detail. I looked them up on Wikipedia. Some of them exist. More of them ought to use it. They mostly don't stay. Um, so what this gives you is hardware protection and some tamper resistance for sensitive data. Now, it's tamper resistance, not tamper protection. We're going to get it. We're going to go into a little bit more of that in a little while. But it's certainly more than we've got right now. And it means that certain attacks, the attacks where somebody takes your hard drive and, and clones it, you're, you've got a useless hard drive, you don't have the key to decrypt it. Unlike most software-based hardware encryption, where eh, I, I take some clones, I throw a, a cracker at, the, at them, I'll eventually guess the password, I'll eventually get through, and even if it's throwing itself out, well, I've got clones, it's not a big deal. Once you put a TPM key on that, that sort of attack won't work. You know, if I actually steal the machine, yes, I can, I can still perform attacks on it. The TPM does have dictionary attack protection that can be turned on. Um, so this does actually provide protection. It's not perfect. You know, it's, it's a chip. It doesn't know who's holding it. But it's a lot more than you've got today. 